for this first episode, volume one of Candy Conversations. I'm here with my brother, man, brother from another mother, Dr. Keenan Davis. Um, Keenan, introduce yourself to the folks. My name is Keenan Davis, and uh, with not with not a lot of introduction, because I want this conversation to be one of substance, one of curiosity, uh, one that challenges not only the mind but also the soul, one that that doesn't just enrich um, our uh, own uh, emotional uh, taste and and uh, uh, our our opportunity to want to move in a different direction as a society. But I want to use this time with each of you that have joined into this telecast as an opportunity that you have two Americans that are encouraged, that are concerned, but they, that we are uh, enlightened by the, 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 the sequences of events that we will discuss today. Hopefully this opportunity will be one that continues the conversation Jason has challenged me to commit to a series of these conversations and with you all, obviously with the feedback, sharing this, we will have the ability to continue. So uh, me giving you a background about what I've done, who I am, I don't wanna say that that's not irrelevant, but I wanna say the substance and the content and richness of our passion to purpose, purposely guide each one of us into a positive next phase of life, I think is the most important thing. Awesome. Well, for those who don't know me in, uh, in Keenan's realm, I'm Jason Warner. Um, I'm a father, I'm a husband, I'm a son. I'm a person that's committed to impacting change in our community. And I'm just excited that my brother uh, graciously accepted this invitation to be able to share these kind of conversations on uh, things that are going on currently. So tonight we're going to talk about COVID-19. We're going to talk about economics. And we're going to talk about policing in America. Um, so let's get started. So COVID-19, Dr. Keenan Davis, married to phys physician Farah Hussein. What do we need to know about COVID right now? Since I hear folks talking about no one seeing COVID on the news anymore, but I hear it on CNN every single night. So what do you have to say about it, brother? I think the hardest thing about COVID-19, uh, the novel virus, coronavirus, is that if you don't know somebody and you don't live in an environment that has already been affected, then you could easily see COVID-19 being a political action item because we are in a presidential election year. And for all of us probably over 25, 30 years old, we understand that in a presidential election year, there are things that are going to happen. There are gonna be novel concepts that disrupt society, whether it's political, social, or economic. And in this case, obviously, from a health perspective, having lived and worked in 15 cities in the world, and certainly most of those being in the United States, I've had the opportunity to build relationships and networks throughout the entire country. And some of those networks reside in New York or Chicago or Detroit, in Boston. Initial hotspots for COVID-19 where individuals were truly contracting the disease and unfortunately falling to the disease. So COVID-19 comes at a time where it's hard for those who wear a political hat. It's difficult for those who believe in conspiracy theories, rightfully so, to truly wrap their mind and arms around how dangerous and how real COVID-19 actually is. You know, it's, it's, it's interesting, right? So um, they just talked about by August, um, and this was back in uh, late March, early April, 
they said they expect to, by August to have 76,000 deaths. We're over 100,000 deaths right now, all right? With places reopening, um, expecting to have over 200,000 deaths by late August, September now. This is real, folks. So for this candid conversation that we're having, mask up, physically distant. If you have underlying health conditions, stay home. Like, how hard is it to stay home for a little while to be here for the long term, right? Um, conspiracy theory, like you said, Dr. Davis, I wouldn't bet my life on it. I think, I think it, it becomes difficult when you don't believe in the information that's being presented to you. And you can speak to people of color who, from a health perspective, have long had distrust with healthcare communities, right? If you're black or brown, you're black, you're three and a half times likely to get COVID or succumb to COVID. If you're Hispanic, Latino, you're 2.6 times likely to succumb to COVID uh, or contract COVID. However, those particular ethnic, ethnic groups, not leaving out Native Americans as well, have long been uh, disjointed from the healthcare system. So, I mean, just case in point, I mean, think about it. From 1932 to 1972, America gave syphilis to hundreds of black men as, as a study. So, I mean, literally, a country gives syphilis to a group of men. So imagine being around that area in Tuskegee or just being of nature and understanding of that tip place, how this could make your trust disjointed in the healthcare system. Now, fast forward 50 years or so, and, and you have uh, communities that have limited or inequitable access to healthcare, right? They have limited, uh, inadequate uh, insurance or lack thereof. So their ability or willingness to say, I don't feel good, but this, I'm not going to get checked. I don't feel good, but I'm not going to the hospital. So now that's helping the, the, the veracity of COVID make you succumb to it versus being able to ward it off and fight it off because of early detection, because you had the confidence, you grew up in a culture of trust with the healthcare system, thereby you had the ability or willingness and courage to go get checked immediately. So, you know, it's interesting that that kind of segues into our next point, right? When we talk about economics, right? So when we talk about inequity in healthcare, it tends to lead to that conversation of inequity in economics, right? So if you don't have access to the economic benefits and the economic growth in your community, nine times out of 10, you don't have access to equitable health care, right? So as we transition out of, you know, the impact of COVID on our communities, uh, we know we need to stay safe, be prepared, physically distant, um, mask up, even if some of your government officials say we're going to open wide up right here in Georgia, they're opening, they opened everything up on Tuesday. Um, in Florida, everything's open. Uh, and even, even to the point that in some airports just yesterday, 500 employees were tested. 280 employees came back positive, right? 280, <laughs> more than 50%. But well, the governor in the state of Florida right now says, you know what, we're not going to, we're not going to put restrictions back. Um, that's dangerous uh, from a health standpoint. But as individuals, as people, I think it's on the, it's the onus of us to make sure that we are doing things to protect ourselves and protect our community. So do what you know is safe. Um, but let's transition into that economics and how not only does economics impact our communities from a wealth standpoint, but from a health standpoint. I mean, I think you, everyone that's listening, first off, thank you all for joining. I've said that before. I'll kind of try to remind my, our gratitude throughout the telecast of the appreciation. Look, it's middle of the day between two and five and change. 
between the West Coast and the East Coast. And we, we are certainly appreciative that you think enough of us, right? To, what do these two uh, capable Americans have to say that's going on with the healthcare crisis, the social healthcare crisis, and obviously the economic challenges that, that, are, that some of us are truly reeling with and have never truly gotten past. And when you can put the 400 richest, wealthiest people on an airplane in this country and they account for 35 cents on the dollar, that alone should allow the common man, right, regardless of creed, color, ethnicity, religion, culture, to galvanize efforts and in the pursuit of a common goal when you have a country with 335 million individuals and you could take 400 people that automatically accrue, account for 35 cent on every dollar from a resource perspective, that alone should get the other 334 million, 900 and 999 <laughs> and 600 individuals, right? to be on the same page, but for whatever reason, that's not the case. And it's not the case because we've always, as a group or as an enclave, worked for self. Right. right. Except, for, except for people of color, right? Except for people of color. And nowhere in this telecast am I going to be a person that points a finger, right? right. I won't. Right? That's, not the, that's not the purpose of this. The purpose of our dialogue, our conversations, are discussing solutions, discussing strategies. If you want to be an ally, this is the wrong place. If you want to be an accomplice, this is the right place. This is a space where we're talking about righting wrongs, how, when, where. And uh, from a group economics perspective, there has been limited effective and efficient movement in the black community since it's stalling in the early 1920s and then again unfortunately in the mid 60s so let's talk about the quote unquote stalling right so stalling stalling is is a nice way to to put it right um uh bombing of communities breaking of wealth uh now distribution of, of, of currency, uh, all of those things go into play, right, when we look at those things. Um, one of the biggest things that I, I want everyone to take away from this process is it's not your fault, right? Even when people kind of push, work together, group together, cooperative economics, if you were quote unquote born black American, you can't own all of the mistrust and distrust you have for your community, right? Um, and it's like, mm -hmm. right? So your last name is Davis, right? My last Correct. name is Warner, right? That's the name that we were given to us. And we were taught to mistrust each other. We were taught um, how to assimilate in this culture. Whereas many other groups that may look like us that come into this country have a sense of culture. So as we move forward toward co cooperative and group economics and trying to build, we have to keep that in mind, right? We're playing, we're playing when you talk about from an inequitable position and other groups come in and, and make it and do well, they have a psychology of self. And I use my wife for example, right? She was born in Ethiopia, and mm -hmm. they're, as a young person, they're taught to learn the lineage, their grandfather's 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 grandfather, and that's how they introduce each other, right? Whose child are you, and whose child's child child are you, right? So you come with a sense of self, and you understand as a people that you can work together because of mm -hmm. that identity that was created, right? So for mm -hmm. Us, we have to do a better job of understanding the trauma that has been, been enacted on us and then move forward and say, you know what, who taught me I shouldn't trust Dr. Davis? Who taught me that I shouldn't trust Jason Warner? 
and, and, and move into a space of understanding we can get through this, but together, right? It can't, it can't be an individual process because no other group, like our, our great friend that we, we, we call friends but haven't met, Dr. Claude Anderson says, it's a race, right? It's a team sport to move forward. I think we have to do a better job of, I was trying, I was gonna share this uh, video. I was gonna do a watch party, but I couldn't figure out how to do it because I've never did a watch party before. <laughs> so I, 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 probably, I probably shouldn't try to do it during, the con right, during our conversation. <laughs> if you see me looking over everybody, I'm, I got my laptop on the side. I'm trying to do a watch party, but I don't know how to do a watch party. So when you don't know how to do something, you probably shouldn't do it, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> uh, but I, would, I think we need to do a better job in this conversation of explaining group economics uh, because uh, that's a term that some of us probably don't have a very good grasp on and don't understand. I was speaking to my mom, great lady, Janice Davis, this morning, one of the best that ever laced them up. Right. And I was asking her, she's traveled with me in different places that I've lived and we've traversed the country to the best of our abilities, been very fortunate. And I said to her, you know, Imagine, Mom, you've been in you've been to Little Italy in New York. Do you ever realize? Do you ever really remember seeing a uh, a soul food restaurant in Little Italy? And I was like, you know, you've been to the North End, which is Little Italy in Boston. I was like, do you really ever remember seeing a a black owned business in Little Italy in Boston? And I was like, well, what about a Chinatown? Do you ever really remember seeing a black owned business in, a, in any of the Chinatowns throughout the country? The one in LA that we frequented last year for your, for, your, for your birthday or the one in other cities? And she said, no. And I was like, here's the thing. You will never see a black owned business. Show me one in a little Italy, a Chinatown, a little in India, a Greek town, but you will always see a pizza place, a Vietnamese nail shop, uh, Eastern European cleaners, an Indian owned hotel, uh, a Chinese food restaurant in any black neighborhood in America. So group economics is, is, has always been practiced. Right. It's always being realized by other enclaves and other ethnic groups and other communities. However, based on the history legal, political, social, economic uh, uh, pillars that have prevented certain uh, outcomes in this country, you have never in modern day seen the black community infiltrate other communities as well as create a community that is by black people, for black people, with black people, right? right? It does not exist. And so until, that's what group economics looks like. Group economics looks like Little Italy. It looks like Chinatown. It looks like Greek town. It looks like Jew town in Chicago. It looks like the enclave, Mexican town in Detroit or all of these, you know what I'm saying, Little India in Toronto. You can just travel the country, travel North America, travel Europe, and you will continue to see how groups have put themselves with a baseline start and foundational, uh, they give themselves foundational agility in order to proceed in a capitalistic society with an economic baseline. So let me let me let me let me jump in here, right? So language really matters, right? So some will hear what you said, and you're talking about exclusivity, right? But I want everyone to understand it's about taking care of home because we all enjoy visiting those communities and interacting in their culture. We need to build at home so people can visit our communities and interact with our culture. The unfortunate piece is we have not come to the revelation that we can build together to create a community for people to, to, to flourish and, and to enjoy what we bring to the table. And how do we do that, right? It's called sacrifice. We have to sacrifice it to say we're going to support 
um, in a city like Atlanta, right? Or let me mm -hmm. give you an even better place, a city like Detroit. Access to real estate to build businesses is basically at pennies on the dollars right now, all right? So just imagine rebuilding Motown in a way that we all start to invest in those communities and we say little Africa in Detroit, all right? Right. Little Black America in Detroit, where we literally can say we're going to help seed these businesses there. And then just like other cultures do, once those businesses become profitable, they seed other business in the collective family in other areas, right? 1.3 trillion, Jason. 1.3 trillion gross domestic product, GDP for short, in the black community, right? Right, right. That's, the ninth, largest, that's the ninth largest country in the world. Right. Black people in America cre create 1.3 trillion dollars a year, which would be equivalent to the ninth strongest, economically strongest country in the world. Right. We deposit every Monday upwards to $1 billion from a faith-based perspective, church, in white-owned banks. Again, coming on here talking about be, back, be black, buy black, think black, and all else, will have, all else will take care of itself is not a positive message for people who aren't black and for some people who are black. Right. I can say with 100% certainty that the way out, the absolute way out to freedom is economic viability. Absolutely. So, so if you tell me that you have, you're, you're creating $1.3 trillion, if you tell me this country's black population is on par with the ninth largest country in the world, then I tell you, you can be free, but you have to use those 35 black owned banks and uh, uh, community uh, uh, credit, unions. credit unions. And you have to make a concerted conscious effort to be black, buy black and think black because everybody else has already done that. The difference between everybody else and you and I on this telecast Nobody from another enclave is on Facebook or on social media galvanizing their people, telling them how to do it, telling the world we're going to do it. Guess what? They just do it. Right. So, so to that point, right? So I like, you know, I'm always about solutions, right? How do we do this, right? So most people go to a, a, a faith-based institution, right? What you have to do is demand that those leaders take their money and put it into banks that are owned by us, all right? It's not saying that we're exclusive and we don't participate in commerce, but every other community sets up and takes care of home first. Like we say at the Own Vision Foundation always, it's like getting on an airplane. What does a flight attendant tell you every single time? If cabin pressure drops below a certain level, masks will fall out of the ceiling. Put your mask on first before you help the person beside you. They tell you to put your mask on before they help you, tell you to put it on a child. Before they tell you to put it on a child. So you have to take care of you first, right? So what we have to do is to say, you know what? We're going to build leverage at this table. Faith-based community, just like you make a deposit in these other large banks, there's a One United, there's a Mechanics and Farmers, there's a Senate and Trust Bank, there's 30 plus banks around this country that you can deposit. And once you start the deposit, because it's called, we talked about sacrifice, right? Because the, 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 the drawback is there's not one on every corner. How do you get one on every corner? You start depositing that billion dollars every Monday in those banks and they can expand their branches, right? So we have to sow the seed of success to reap that harvest in our community.
We cannot just wait on, oh, somebody has to do this. Right? Bank of America just said they're going to donate a billion dollars over the next however many years to black causes. However, for the past few years, they keep getting hit by the Justice Department with discriminatory practices in how they lend and how they, they, uh, they bank with black and brown people across this country, right? Absolutely. A billion dollars now, but they've profited on, on, on higher interest rate and excess fees in the tunes of trillions over the past however many years, right? So all but how much are they getting every how much are they getting every Monday? I mean right. if you know right. we're up to a billion, Bank of America being one of the four big big boxes, right? They they're easily probably let's just break it in the forest, right? They're probably getting upwards to a quarter of a billion dollar deposited each Monday. So right. and the challenge is they're not lending back to the community to the, who's depositing this money. See that's the problem. Right. That's the challenge. So, listen, if you're not willing to do, everyone out there that's listening, right, that's black specifically, if you're not, re if you're not willing to do what other races have done, if you're not willing to do what other men have done, and if you're not willing to do what other cultures have done, then essentially the only thing you're willing to do is die. Period. You know, the interesting thing is, right, um, we say a lot. I'm just taking it off. You can't solve a problem with the same mindset used to create it, right? You can't solve a problem with the same mindset used to create it. So what does that mean? What does that mean? We cannot move forward in a scenario where we're not reading the instructions, right? They make tax laws for a reason, right? So someone can benefit off of that. The, the CARES Act just passed, right? And we're talking about economic viability. So they gave out the $1,200 to individuals making under a certain amount, right? But if you didn't read the fine print, you did not see that these millionaires and billionaires had a tax credit and a tax cut that made them virtually millions just by virtue of this CARES Act. So we have to start to read the instructions and look at what other people do to become successful. That's the only work way we're gonna do it. And we can't wait on anyone else to do it, right? We are going to have to see the change we wanna see in our communities. Somebody's gonna get a little taken aback by the comment when I ended it with, you know, you know I, because I'm very, at this point in my life, right? I'm very straightforward, straight up no chaser. Right. And the understanding of this is that I'm just gonna pepper you with information. I'm gonna pepper you with data. I'm gonna brandish the facts over and over again until you either accept it or lay down and, and go away. That's how, that's how the relationship is going to work for the rest of my life. So when I understand that the, the net worth of an average white, white family is $115,000 and the net worth of an average black family is $1,700, and that net worth of $1,700 of an average black family is projected to be in 2053, in 33 years, zero dollars, which is the exact same net worth of a black family in 1850. Then I don't have the patience, I don't have the, the charisma to be to, to, to only speak in one language, and the language is there is a season and there's a time for everything right. under the head. And if I can't look at you, whether virtually or real life, and say, the season is right now, the time is right now, the heavens is the new season and the new time right now, we have no more time on the clock to figure out how a law is going to save us. We have no more time on the clock to figure out how a policy is going to save us. We have no more time on the clock to figure out how another person is going to save us. The only person that can save us is us, is us. So, you know, it's interesting, right? Um, as you know, 
what, five years ago, we started Own the Vision. Um, and at that point, we said, you know what, how we save us, we build that economic infrastructure. So I will give you all the keys to the city. 44 plus million folks that look like you and me in this country. Just imagine, and I'm not even going to go as big as Dr. Davis did in a post last week. Just imagine if every one of us donated $1 per month to the fund. One dollar, that's $44 million every single month, close over half a billion dollars a year. Imagine what we can fund and start. We don't have to worry about begging for someone to do something, right? Corporations fund organizations so that they have an exchange. It's a talking piece, right? You can't say something because they have given you funding. But if we fund ourselves, we can be unapologetically with our conversation to the community, right? When other groups are talking about what they can and want to do, they're unapologetic with their conversation because they're not beholden to someone else's dollar. We have to say we're time to make the sacrifice and see their own change. If you don't want to do it with the Own the Vision Foundation, you can do it with multiple other groups across the country, right? You can start a co-op in your community. Just imagine if you get 12,000 people in your community to donate $12 a month for 12 mm -hmm. You can seed 10 nonprofit organizations $100,000. You can seed 10 entrepreneurs, $25,000, and have money left, left over for administrative costs. Let me say this. I just look, people, people look at on, I, I just kind of, because I, I don't have, I don't know who's on Facebook, right? Because I'm just looking at the screen, right. which is good. All I can see is you or me. For those who are looking and listening and trying to learn, I don't have all the answers. Jason doesn't have all the answers. We have a few. We do have a few answers, and I'm going to share everything. I research ad nauseum. I talk to people. I network. Network is one letter away from not work. The only difference is the E and the O, right? Network, not work. So I'm, I'm networking, so I'm always working, right. right? And let me tell you how this thing works for us, because we're going to be on this group. Every time he and I do this, I'm going to spend more. I'm more passionate about group economics than I am anything else when it comes to the survival of black people. Anything else. Because if you're born with a health defect, I can't help you, right? You, I mean, unfortunately, you're done. But I can help you, and I want to help you if you have good health and you have a fair shot in that respect. The economic part should not be your death. Right. It should not be your Achilles heel. It should not be your impediment in terms of social and upward mobility. So let me tell you how this thing works. Right. You can go to Memphis. You can go to Memphis, Detroit, Baltimore, Cleveland, Jacksonville, Florida and Chicago right now. I'm just going to use a few and you can sneak sneaky. You can go to Philly, too. And you can go to these cities and you can buy houses and buildings for buildings, meaning two family, four family for under one hundred thousand dollars. Everybody knows it. All you got to do is go look and you can we can. I'm sorry. Time out we can effectively start to build social ecosystems in these cities that has housing and school and health care and uh, grocery stores. The reason why we have health disparity, one of the reasons why we have health disparities in the black community is because Whole Foods and Trader Joe's, they're not going to put organic food stores in the hood. That's not what they do. You know what I'm saying? That's not what society's going to do. Society's going to put the liquor store. Now we might get a few weed stores. They're going to put the corner store, bodega. They're going to put the check cashing joint, and they're going to put some uh, hot fried chicken, some fast food type stuff, and then they're going to tell you to survive in a bootleg grocery store, right, that, that, that you, you don't really have all the adequate things that would help you survive, and you're certainly not going to have any infrastructure to get hired in that neighborhood. So I'm not going to educate you, I'm not going to medicate you, and I'm not going to employ you. That's how you die in the hood. So we got to employ ourselves, educate ourselves, and basically medicate ourselves. So we got to buy land, buy distressed property, and instead of us 
running to these universities, running to these middle class neighborhoods, we need to figure out a way how to make our neighborhoods better. Absolutely. If we have, we have the financial and economic funding, we have the aptitude, we have the survivor skills. Hell, if you tell me one group of people could get on a boat for 30 days at a time, survive off of sweet potatoes, palm oil, look that up, and rice, and limited water with defecation all around, in chains, diseases, no communication opportunities, because we, we all speak 50 different languages. And if we can survive that boat ride, just a boat ride through inclement weather, perhaps multiple seasons, get here, stand upright for another 50, 60, 70 years, survive that hellacious treatment through slavery and reconstruction and Jim Crow and segregation and still produce kings and queens in 2020, there is absolutely no way I would ever bet. Some people, I hear people black, Jason Warner say, man, I wish I could just hit the lottery. You hit the lottery because you black. It ain't no bigger lottery ticket than having this melanin skin. That is the, that is the lottery ticket. So let me tell you, I'm, I'm, we, we're going to pivot, but I'm going to give you Get me under control, because <laughs> Dr. Davis, my, you on there. So my, we're gonna we're gonna, pivot, we're gonna pivot to the next and final topic and then open for questions. But I'm gonna give you two ways, two ways right now, because I gave you the one about collective seating, where you start talking about uh, buying property and land and different things like that. So one, if you don't have it right now, you better have a life insurance policy on you, yourself and your children, right? That grows net worth. Second, if you're looking for land, use the tools and the resources that are right there and read the instructions. No access to health, USDA has zero to low, super low interest loans to start farm. If you live in a rural community, go to usda.gov and look at their grants and their super low interest rate loans to start farms in rural areas to, 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 to work on those food deserts and the inequities in their community. They're giving you the money to do it, but we don't want to read the instruction. So if you live in areas like South Georgia, South Texas, Arkansas, Mississippi, Alabama, where there is land that is fruitful and is there, go and take advantage. And the great part about it is they put caps on the income that you can make. So if you don't make a lot of money, it's more beneficial for you to get access to this land. Right? $500 could get you a plot of land. $1,000 could get you a plot of land. $1,000 could get you not only the plot of land, but now you got the resources and the opportunity to go put food on that land. Less than 10,000 businesses and jobs created by those businesses owned by black people create agriculture, mining, or utility jobs. We, we have uh, the black community, 95% of all businesses that are black owned do not have employees. Only 10,000 out of less than 10,000 out of that 2.6 million black businesses are attributed to the agriculture or manufacturing or the mining or the utilities industry. So we are essentially to Jason's point, not creating the actual baseline opportunities that truly contribute to our survival. Last and point. something as simple as agriculture, not simple, but simple in the simplistic and fundamentally and rudimentary uh, uh, to our survival. Listen, Jason, you're gonna have to keep me under control. Yeah, last, my mama, last, my last, wife, last, 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 last. My wife told me I can't I can't come home tonight. <laughs> if I come on here and I act like somebody, listen, um, why Montreal? We going we gonna pivot. Why are you in a cap? I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you I'm gonna give you the cap real quick. Let me let me just give you one one more stat. In grocery stores, 1.3 percent of the dry goods in grocery stores are black owned. That's rice. That's your your cake mixes, that's your, mm -hmm. 
salt, sugar, all that stuff. If they're giving away money or giving you access to very low interest rate loans to do and to produce those things, why not take advantage of it? Master Great. P started pushing out rice because <laughs> he understood that we have to eat and we have to eat healthier, right? So uh, I'm, I'm gonna let you pivot to the, to talk, to talk about why you got the hat, Dr. Davis on, but we're going to have a discussion. And as you come out of that, I want you to give your definition and what it means to you to defund police departments, because that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And especially in this climate, right? We have a lot that is, is surrounding police um, and police issues in our community. So give us your hat and then talk about what your definition, your understanding, because if folks don't know, Dr. Davis is a professor of law and policy. So it's not just, oh, my brother Keenan, I'm bringing on, but a person that really understands how this stuff works. Thank you. No, I, I, full disclosure, I mean, I, for the most part, I work for myself, but I get to teach a little bit. I love the kids. Uh, and have the opportunity to work with two world-class universities, right? Literally world-class. One is one of the top 10 in the world. Uh, and, and obviously one of one is the top 40 in the country. And I, I'm, I'm, I'm privileged to be, able to, to, to be able to work with both of those universities. But I am who I am and they know who I am and I'm gonna be who I'm gonna be, right? So I, and, and, that's, how, and that's just, that's the, that's the route that I take in life. I, I could have wore a suit. I got a closet full of tailor suits and I got some nice suits, right? Every color, pinstripe, you name it. However, from a, from, a, from a community policing perspective, I'm not doing the culture and the social, uh, uh, I'm not doing the environment any good by wearing something and sounding a certain way to make people feel more comfortable with another educated, articulate, communicative uh, black individual, black male that can create a conversation at a level in a suit because that's the person that's not getting shot by the police. Right. I, I don't recall any of these people that were suited and booted getting killed by the police, right? It's an average, everyday looking dude that's getting killed by the police, right? So it's my job to be communicative, articulate, right? Well spoken, well researched, well researched, well resourced, and every other acronym and adjective that you want to attribute to my character to look and feel just like the average, everyday black person that should be given the same, the same opportunity. As in the same perception, I was once told, Jason, that perception is another person's reality, right? right. And so if the perception that uh, a black man in a fitted and a white t-shirt is only a certain kind of way, guess who they gonna keep shooting and killing? Black dudes in a fitted and a white t-shirt. Right? Right. right. And that's not, and we have to break that cycle of perception. And so Absolutely. I'm commitment to myself and then as far as the expo goes you know a cool guy named by the name of earl little met a beautiful woman in montreal that gave birth to one of my favorite and all-time folks malcolm x malcolm little so earl little met malcolm's mom in montreal so hat off the you know <laughs> it wouldn't be no you know without montreal there wouldn't be no malcolm so that's where it's at so let's let's talk about this new policing, defunding the police. And I'm, I'm gonna give you something that I would say is very, very controversial based off of first response, right? Um, there is an initiative to ban chokeholds nationwide, all right? I say that is the wrong approach at all. Like, why would you ban a submission technique, right? So we watch MMA. They have chokeholds and other submission techniques every day. It's not about the technique, it's about the policing of the technique. In MMA, what happens? When that person taps out, the referee comes in. So I would rather a less lethal chokehold that the partner is required to say, this person has tapped out or submitted, and then you release, than for you to take your firearm out and shoot this person. All right, because when you throw the baby out with the bathwater, <laughs> all they have is the pull they're gonna shoot. Because I'm six foot six, 250 pounds. 
Mm. They're not going to tussle with me. They're going to shoot me. I would rather them put me in a submissive choke where I am compliant and their partner is trained to say, tap, just like the MMA uh, referee that tells that, that fighter, hey, break it up. They're not dying. There's so many mixed martial arts, judo, jujitsu, all these people that are trained. And let's talk about training, all right? Your wife is a physician, correct? She had to go to school for undergrad, <laughs> medical school, residency, all of these different things. In most places around the country, the state of Georgia only has a 13-week mandatory training for officers. Now, more jurisdictions have higher standards than that. But if you're dealing with life and death as a medical professional, and you have to have years and years of training, why is it that you're in law enforcement, that you have life and death in the palm of your hands, and you don't have to have years and years of training? And I, before I pull it to you, I do say we don't need to defund but we need to add more funds because these men and women in law enforcement are underpaid to perform the jobs at a level of expectation that we want them to exceed at, right? If we want them to have the psychological aptitude, if we want them to have the training that they need, and we want people to run to say, this is the profession that I want to dedicate my life and my time to, we need to give them the resources, but specifically, we need to give them extensive training. There is no reason that the only recertification that they have to do is how to fire a gun, right? You need to have recertification to be able to de-escalate. De you need recertification every six months like you have for your firearm to, to deal with mental health issues. You need recertification every time to look at what the trauma of the job is doing to you because you're working in communities where you say, you know what, I may not be seeing people in the correct lens, right? Right here in Atlanta, if you saw a human being in the correct lens, you would have taken him home or taken him to the drunk tank or, or called an Uber for this young man, not shoot him in the back, and then have apologists sit there and say and make excuses for shooting someone in the back. That's fair. You know, we won't share the exact same sentiment, but that's what'll make these telecasts rich. And that's right. what I think will make our relationship with the listeners fundamentally strong and authentic. You, people will say, I grew up in Hot Springs, Arkansas, right? Deep South, Bible Belt. You know how that goes, right? One side, one railroad tracks, white, white, white people stay on one side of the track, Black people stay on the other side of the track. You know, black people go to one church, white people go to their church, right? That, that's, that's where I grew up and that's where it is. That's, that's, right. I'm not saying people don't intermingle and work together and are friends and jolly, et cetera. There is that distinction, right? Absolutely. You know, with that being said, though, the idea that the police, that we need, that we need to you know, get back to uh, regain trust in the police, Show me one black person that's not a clown cake that says that they ever trusted the police. Like, where is this idea that regaining trust in the police is applicable to black people? Po police, if I'm not going to curse a lot, but police have literally kicked our ass and tortured us historically forever. We, we never, listen, that, that the serve and protect that was not for black people. Police were the people who were brought terror on black people. Absolutely. So the idea of regaining trust and rebuilding trust is farce. It's asinine. And it's one that needs to be reimagined and redefined. What, what I'm saying is we need, as a, specifically as the black community, to build trust with police. That's fundamentally what takes place because the culture of policing, 
I, I want to take y'all down a trip, a travel trip, aviation, because I think aviation is equitable in terms of culture to draw an analogy for community policing and law enforcement. Right. In aviation, you have a pilot and a co-pilot. Sometimes a pilot, depending on how small the plane is, but most times you got a pilot and a co-pilot. And if you had, say, three planes flown by pilots that were rogue, now, aviation culture would not feel that was acceptable. Absolutely. The aviation culture would not recycle bad pilots who were capable of sending an entire plane down at any given time to another airline, to another part of the industry. That would not take place. But for some reason, police and law enforcement feel the need that it's acceptable to regurgitate and recycle rogue, bad police. So the culture of policing needs to change. This yeah. idea that we have to just live with a plane potentially going down by a bad police in a black community every now and then is unacceptable. Absolutely. So, so it's unacceptable, right? It's unacceptable because we contribute $1.3 trillion to this economy. It's unacceptable because we don't give you, we still give you 97% of all of our money to every other community, primarily the white community. It's unacceptable because you are indebted to our culture. It's unacceptable because we vote and we pay taxes the same way every other American votes and pays taxes. It's absolutely unacceptable. And I'm tired of hearing all of these politicians on either side of any either color or culture or creed make excuses for the acceptability of the culture of recycling and regurgitation of bad police. So I, I hope I hope you did not hear at all me say anything about recycling and, and and giving them a pass, right? I said we need to reimagine and retrain a whole culture, right? We cannot accept any of what's going on. And we cannot throw the baby out with the bathwater, right? We cannot be in a situation where we have, where we go from defunding and have, just like we have these private prisons, now we have private police forces that are policing our community where folks go from, from a quote unquote accountable to 1099 employees that are walking around with a gun in our communities. So now we're gonna have a, a next phase of George Zimmerman. I am not for that. What I need to do, just like you said, if there is a a, 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 a a pilot that is not doing a good job, they're not going to be a pilot anywhere in the country. Just like if a physician was doing, had malpractice suits in multiple states, they're not going to be a physician in any other state in the country. So we need overarching reform, but not an overarching push to say we're going to get rid of every tactic because, example, a good, a good friend of mine posted this the other day. If your mama is getting beat by a six foot four, 300 pound dude on PCP and someone calls 911, they tase this dude, he rips it off, what? What do you want them to do? Do you want him to shoot this man? Do you want them to tase, try to tase him again? Do you want to administer some submission type of hole? Or you want him to beat them down with his ass baton? Right? So we need to reimagine re the training for the whole culture of policing and get rid of the folks that should not be there at all. And we, as people, do not have to actually try to gain a new relationship. If I did you wrong, Kenan, I am, it's the onus on me to rebuild a re relationship with you. So I 100% agree that they need to rebuild the relationship, not rebuild, they need to build a relationship because they've never built one in the first place with black America. 
So, and so before they need to be have some overarching training that is 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 equitable for communities and understanding the cultural competency that is needed in communities specifically of color. Before there was a video, you know what I'm saying, and, and there still right. isn't a video. But I mean, let's call it what it is. There's there there is no video at the bank when you're trying to get a loan, right. and you get turned. Right? There is right. no video in the admissions office when you get denied. There's no video when you're getting a, trying to get a job that you're overqualified for. There's no video in the over criminalized for, for a charge. Right? That someone else didn't get as criminalized. Case in point, like a Dylan Roof, where he gets a foot. Same case, brother Vanderbilt played football. Dylan Roof, Stanford. Dylan Roof gets off, rapes a white girl. He gets off for it. Go figure. Like, dude, same thing. He gets 25 years, rightfully right. so. Should have got 25. Throw him up under the jail. Give him 65 years. Dylan Roof gets nothing. There's no video, generally speaking, right, for what's going on and how you are perceived and why your life is $1,700. Uh, the, the net worth and value of your life. So we could talk about COVID. We could talk about the police, all two factors that are unfortunately affecting the black community at a disproportionate rate. But at the end of the day, it comes down to value, right? You don't see the police gunning down Italian, Jewish people, Greeks, Hispanics to an extent, unfortunately, black and brown, right? And their own at the same rate, it just does not happen. Because you know what? Those individuals' lives they, are valued. They own They're valued. The, 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 perception and the, the, the perception and the underlying conscious and subconscious of everybody else except black men or black women is that our, you don't wake up and say, you know what? When I see that black dude in a, in a, in a, in a black male in a uh, Montreal Expo Twitter hat, I don't see him being a, a father or a son or a major contributor to society. I see that person as somebody that probably just, it, he was doing a crime and shouldn't be pulled over and I'm gonna treat him a certain kind of way. And until we take ownership, buy black, be black, think black, all everything else won't fall into place. So police will continue, I don't care how trained they are. And I do agree with you. That yes, training will help. More training, hiring better people, more money, adding a degree baseline, adding a degree baseline. I agree, you will get a better quality. However, the perception of the black man, listen, uh, Arendelle County dog, Chesapeake, Chesapeake, Arendelle County, Maryland, Chesapeake Bay Retriever was unfortunately killed by the police right. and that family was granted a little over two million dollars for the loss of their beloved dog alton sterling still hasn't had his case settled no dollar brianna taylor's killers are literally still, still on the loose still just walking around probably eating a chicken sandwich at papa right and the endless Terrence Crutcher, no closure. Uh, I, Michael Brown, all Sterling, Michael Brown, no closure. Yet, when we do get closure, they're putting a value on our lives. Now they'll put four or five million now, right, on the civil suit. But right. before the video and social media, the value was 600,000, 800,000, 1.2. I did a story about a year and a half ago with the Arendelle County Chesapeake Bay Retriever, comparing it against three black lives that had been murdered by the police, and all of those lives didn't add up to the 2.3 million. Not to mention, Aaron Andrews, a sideline reporter for Fox, got a settlement for 55, 55 million. million. 55 million because, and I'm not saying her privacy shouldn't have been exposed, right? Who's to say? It should have. It shouldn't have been exposed. It was wrong. But how can you? At the same rate, this family got six. Uh, Garner's family got six. Uh, Five point nine. Tamir Rice family got six. Uh, and Freddie Gray's family got six point four. Family got six point four million. Aaron Andrews got fifty-five million. Like I'm just trying to figure out. 
when is society going? I see that black dude in, in, in life. And guess what? I'm not going to wait for that. Right. So, so these are candid conversations, right, brother? And so there is no but. It's and, right? So we look at reimagining policing and we look at taking control of our communities, right? Taking control of Everything economics, else. taking control of, of how we move forward, right? From, from a standpoint of making sure that we have life insurance, making sure that our businesses are set up correctly, making sure we take advantage of USDA and uh, other low interest loans to, to grow and expand because they're there, but we just- Oh, Sterling still hasn't had his case settled, no doubt. Right. Still just so, walking around properly, right? And the endless to Michael Brown homes, yet when we do get closure, they're putting- Do we, do we have, when do we have to take questions? Oh, point two. I did a story about a year and a half. I don't know why. I'm, I'm getting double feedback. Now. <laughs> get out to the 2.5 million, 55 million because, well, how can you, the highest six, uh, Freddie Gray's family, trying to figure out when is that? You still there, Davis? I feel like I'm, um, I'm, we, we have, I'm getting normal, but yeah. I'm just wondering when do we yeah. have to take, uh, well, not have to, but when is, right. when is we it do. Time to take questions? I'm right here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Yeah, now. I'm right here. We're, we're having a okay. Is that good? Yeah. So I was having a, uh, a Teddy Raleigh type moment right now. So you know we're back. Um, but uh, yeah. So you know one of one of I won't say it's a question, but it's a com comment a comment that I saw. Um, uh, JJ Evans said that I think the chokehold should be banned, then brought back after training. Absolutely right. So you know we need to have. I'm getting I'm getting messages saying that. There is an error message for people trying to get on. I don't know what that means. Or been trying to get on. They, I, I just looked over at my computer real quickly, and I was just not to interrupt. Sorry, I just Are didn't know. Where, I don't know what that. Means. I just been watching you the whole time, so I just you know. Yeah. I'm over here. I'm trying my best. I see, I see folks. I see folks in. I'm not sure. Oh, I think there was. I'm trying my best. I know my mama gonna watch this. <laughs> uh, I know my mama gonna watch this. I know my wife is gonna have some say so, and I know my family, my family, is going to have feedback, feedback, and that's what I fight for, uh, as well as everyone else that wants me to fight with them and what, fight for them. So Jason, who's my, you know, one of my day ones, he knows, he knows me. Like this is the reason why I think I was so hesitant to really commit to this because this is everything to me. Right. This is everything. Well, see, the thing is, right, we've been doing this work behind the scenes for so long um, and telling that story. And, 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 and when the passion bubbles up, um, it's something that has need to be heard. But however, and, and like we talked about previously, we have to offer solutions to move forward. Like, I cannot stand just rhetoric conversations, right? We need to make sure that we continue to push people to, to, to solutions that are impactful, right? And that are attainable in every community. Uh, one solution in this right now, every, even right now, look at your city council and your county commission agenda. That's got, they have to legally publish it. Look at and see what's coming up because right now they're having conversation that could impact how we move forward. They're having conversations about funding. They're having conversation about how policing will be done in your community. They're having conversations about, in Atlanta, they're clearly gonna have a nationwide search for a new police chief, right? For in, in Seattle, nine times out of 10, that chief, police chief won't be there too much longer, right? So they're gonna have conversations on how they reimagine that. They have re conversations right now in Minneapolis and St. Paul about how they're redefining, defunding police, right? So we need to be able to not only listen to the conversation, but stand up and be active in those conversations. Because I cannot tell you how many people will not show up to a city council meeting, especially with COVID going on, when many people are at home, filing through social media, you can get on one of those city council or county commission Zoom meetings and let your voice be heard so that 
your your community can have the resources that you need and that's a part of it where like you said we vote and we vote in numbers we change the course of communities about with our vote right so when we're engaged in the process not just at the voting booth but after the fact and pushing our elected officials to to do what we ask them to do in their community even if you didn't vote for that person right they're accountable as your representative Let's say your person didn't win, they still represent your community. And you should hold her or him accountable in that space. So those are the little things that you can do right now, right? Look up USDA uh, uh, loans. Look up opportunities to purchase land and in, in, in property in, in poor, poor, impoverished cities that you can get real estate for pennies on the dollar. Because guess what? They're not making any more land and they're always going to be somewhere that a person has to live. These are the types of things that we can start to look at that inequity in economics, right? That we can put a value on our life in policing uh, because you made a move forward to change the narrative in your community and not wait on somebody else to give you something to change the narrative in your community. I would also add that, and I know you aggregating the questions right now, so while you're doing that, I would add for all of us, for those who work in corporate America, I want to speak directly to you, right? I don't care what color you are, I could care less, right? But if you're going to be an accomplice instead of an ally, because accomplice, I'll tell you what, if you really want, what does that mean to be a, an ally of the black community versus an accomplice, right? An ally is like cheering me on from the side, like, yay, go, Black Lives Matter, that's cool. You're rah, 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 right? And I, and, I, and I tell you, like, hey, I need to go, I, I need to go handle some stuff, right? And you're like, okay, good, good luck, be careful, you know, I wish you well. That's what an ally is. An accomplice, hey, look, I, uh, Shirley, Brooke, Bridget, Sally, John, I got to go handle something. I'm driving, get in. That's what an accomplice is. You down for the cause, like four flats, right? So... If you want to be accomplice and you're in corporate America, this is what we need to do right now. Because there, there is a window of opportunity. Let's not be, let's be honest here. And within that window of opportunity, let's seize it. So we already know disproportionately that leadership doesn't look like the population. I mean, think about this. You got 50 governors. 13% of the population says we should have about four, five governors at least, right, that are black, six, seven governors that are black, at least, based on the population? Absolutely. Zero, right? We got 100 senators. How many senators of color we got, right? Kamala Harris, Tim Scott, right? So with, with that being said, we know leadership, not only politically, but financially, is disproportionate. How about going into your place of work, meeting with, if you don't have a, a a, a placeholder position called Chief Diversity Officer, DeVos, uh, a, a VP of Equity and Inclusion, somebody in HR that's in social responsibility, CSR, corporate social responsibility, that identify a person in HR and say, look, I've been here for 15 years. I've been an accountant. I've been here 17 years. I've been an operations manager. I've been here 12 years. I've been, you know, uh, a, 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 an educator, assistant principal, or assistant professor. But I recognize that we have zero diversity and inclusion, and that's what this Black Lives Matter movement means. See, in every, every period of time in history, there are eras and there are ages, right? You have the dark ages, and it was dark as hell. You got the middle ages and the enlightenment age, right? And you have the civil rights era. Well, this is being defined. We're living through history. Make no mistake about it. whether it's with COVID or whether it's with, uh, you know, the, 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 the light on police brutality, right? And the inequality in the social aspect of Black American, Native Blacks, as I would like to term it. Thank you, Dr. Claude Anderson, uh, for bringing me up to speed with that term. I think that we have to figure out in this era of exposure, because that's what this is called. We're exposing the inequalities in Black people from a health perspective. We're exposing the inequalities in Black people from, the, from a social perspective. And we're exposing the inequalities in Black people from an economic perspective. 
So now that we're in this era of exposure, our, our advocates and our accomplices have to shine a light that has been exposed. And you need to take that conversation to the powers that be and say, look at our place of business. Look at our management. Look at our decision makers. NFL, you can tell me you're going to, and I'm, look, everybody knows, I'm a former NFL executive. Promoted three times in inaugural uh, council for diversity council. They had me on the diversity council, go figure, uh, which was probably a good idea, right? And, and so I, I, I have a really good name there. However, the NFL is full of them, right? Because you got 32 rich folks sitting around in a room and don't nothing look like the 75% of the players. Right. I could give you three black people that could put together the same network as crap. I could give you three black people that could put this, put together the, the same the same network as, as Haslam, or I could keep going, right? right? However, that doesn't exist. So the diversity inclusion in corporate America, that's something we all can do. Everybody that's listening and watching, if you're wondering, like, eh, I don't really want to buy something. I don't know if I'm ready to build something. Cool. You're going somewhere tomorrow, virtually or in person, nine to five. Right. Let's go do it. And let's change that conversation, right? So it should not be when you look at a Starbucks, they say, oh, we support Black Lives Matter. Then you can't wear a T-shirt. And then, oops, now we're going to give you a T-shirt, right? Because that's lack of diversity in leadership, lack of diversity in thought. You're only focusing from one lens, right? We're giving you and this is an opportunity to get that new pair of glasses that gives you a different lens and a different perspective, right? So you can see the footsteps that someone else has gone through, right? So you can see that there's an opportunity. There's some super smart individuals that have been working with you, alongside of you, that deserve an opportunity to let their voice be heard. And just imagine, just imagine, one second, if that diversity of thought came into your business, just from a pure business structure and economics, if you spoke the language of the people you wanted to serve, just imagine how many more people would spend money with you because they know that you hear their language. But if you only speak from one lens, this, 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 this lens that is projected on your own simple understanding, your business will never grow. Dr. Davis talked about $1.3 trillion. It's still out there, right? And every business person wants to grab it. Now, now I'm putting on that business hat, right? Every business person wants to have it, right? Background marketing and communications. If you speak the language of the people, they will hear you and they will buy from you. Mm -hmm. When you do foolishness, hey, you're going to shut it down. Black Twitter done showed you that. You, you'll be fired. Your business will go up in flames. Not, not literally, but figuratively. And you will not move the dot. So it will behoove you, right? NFL, all these other corporations, Bank of America giving a, a fake billion dollars. It will behoove you to put people at the table and listen to the people that have the lens and the ear of the community versus sitting up in this, this big pie in the sky to say, oh, these are the things that we want to do, right? You, you, you have to be intentional about listening, listening to perspectives, listening to ideas, listening to the way the diversity of what makes America so great brings to the table. And that's how we'll start to change, like my brother said, if you want to be an accomplice in making change. We don't need any more just allies and cheerleaders. We need accomplices to make sure there is equity and everyone has that opportunity for justice, for opportunity for success, opportunity for health, wealth, and prosperity. You should not feel comfortable every single day looking at the TV. And if you're on this situation, this, this live, this stream, looking at me or Dr. Davis, you should not be comfortable to know that I've had 10 guns placed in my face in my life. Not one from a robber, not one from a criminal, not one from a quote unquote thug. All 10 have been by a person with a badge. Because 
I looked a certain way in a community that I probably shouldn't have been in, and I drove a nice truck. Before the age of 20, I've stared down the barrel of 10 guns. You shouldn't be okay with that. Change. 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 So we've been over on this for an hour and a half. One, we want to be able to continue the conversation. So we want to know how often do you want to see candid conversation, not just with my, myself and Dr. Davis, but other guests and other folks to share their experiences, to give you solutions, to move forward, right? We want to, to, to spark the change so that you can think of things that you never even thought of, right? To move this dial. We want you to engage with people that are very smart, that have the, the tools to move you forward, that have been exposed to different things, to different cultures, to different opportunities. Um, so, so let us know, we're, we're here. One, I wanna thank you, Dr. Davis, my brother, for finally agreeing to sit down and having this conversation we talk every day on the phone, but Agreed. conversation um, with the people, right? Um, you know, I'm just thankful that I have you in my life. We, we, we talk about these things, me, you, Lewis, Blackman, Sean, you know, we talk about how we, we sow into each other's lives so much, man. And I, and I appreciate you just being able to sow into this, this social media community. Um, you know, when I share and say from the desk of Dr. Keeman Davis, like, this is my brother for real, y'all. Like, we down like four flats. Um, you know, it, it, it is what it is, man. So I appreciate you, brother. I would say this. I know we're closing. I, I would challenge those that have listened and those that will listen. That if, if this is something in terms of substance, in terms of communication, in terms of solution, that you feel is not only applicable to your life, but it's transferable to someone else's life. That you would share it and you would take some of the points that we've communicated and made and you would circulate those in your own silos, in your own side conversations, in your own places of work, worship or places of employment and begin to create a new culture I said this earlier and I mean it. There is, a, there is a season and there is a time for everything under the heavens. And the time is now. The season has begun. And the heavens, we live beneath. And I want everybody to understand that we're all culpable for what is going to take place. We're all capable of defining the best possible outcome. Can we do it? God in nature created us all. And it's up to our own creative genius to take us to the next level. There will be some sacrifice. There will be some compromise. There will be some tears shed. But if you are willing to look at the next man, not by the color of his skin, but by the character and by the content of that character, and you're willing to acknowledge that all of us deserve deserve to have life liberty and the pursuit of happiness in this life in this one not the next one but in this one inbox me i'll give you my phone number and i will give you every network resource that i have at my disposal to make sure that you get there. All right, brother. 
I appreciate you. Um, I see folks saying that they want to see this weekly um, at, or at least bi-weekly talks. Uh, yeah. this, is how we go. This, this is how we're going to seed the change, right? Because what they say, knowledge is a power, but this applied knowledge, right? I don't want to pontificate. I want to give folks the tools to success. I want to bring folks on here that have the tools to success so that as a community, not, forget this, not as just a community, right? As a country, we can work together in prosperity. Because it's one thing that we build ourselves up and we can. We also have to build relationship and understanding, right? Uh, we, we also have to, to be able to hear what other people are saying while we're building and growing. Right? Because we, again, we can't do this alone. We can't continue, we can't build just our community and expect no one to, to engage in commerce with us and to be sustainable in this marketplace. We're only 13, 14% of the population. Yes, yes, we, we have a, 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 a large spending power, but in comparison to all the other groups, our spending power is not that large, right? So we have to be able to listen. We have to be able to engage. We have to be able to walk down the street and my children, specifically my boys, and I love my girls with everything that's in me. Mm -hmm. I get it. It's part of it. They, they, they cannot. <laughs> they cannot just because they've done everything that you've been asked of them to do. They cannot because my wife and I did everything they asked us to do, asked us to do and, and prepare ourselves for success. drive down the street in a nice car in a nice neighborhood because we've done the right things and be stopped at gunpoint. I can't let that happen, not on my watch. My oldest son, we have driving lessons right now. He'll be 16 tomorrow. Hmm. I'm deathly afraid for him to drive. Deathly afraid. He'll be 16 tomorrow. He's about six foot three, two hundred and twenty-five pounds. I don't want him to just in his loving, joyful, peaceful spirit to have to experience just because he's a big black man in this country what it feels like to look down the barrel of a gun because you're driving a nice car in a nice neighborhood. We have to change that reality today. And it's going to take engagement with other communities. So like you said, you came in here as Dr. Keenan Davis and did in a white tee because they need to see articulate, educated, communicative, well-rounded, well-traveled men that wear fitted in a, in a white tee but also can wear a suit and not think twice but that is another amazing brother walking down the street another human being i, I need I, I i cannot i cannot i cannot go another day without that changing so i will fight every single day to make sure that changes i will give every last piece of me to make sure that changes I challenge you, Facebook, help us get at least 500 shares. Seriously, I got a post right now with over 4,000 shares. I got several of them with a couple of hundred. Like, like, let's do this so that we can bring on resources. I love to, I don't think enough of myself to feel like I can do this on my own. And Jason doesn't think enough of himself to think he could do this on his own. But we feel like together with you all, we can, we can get, the, get the necessary resources that will be solution driven that will answer questions that will solve problems point us in the right direction orient orient us into a future that's not only profitable but it's healthy and it's peaceful for everyone 
With that being said, this has been the first episode, volume one of Candid Conversations. We appreciate you. We love you. Dr. Davis, my brother, I love you, bro. I appreciate you. Until we meet again, good night.